Precision, accuracy, and safety. These are the cornerstones of successful mining operations. Quality human resources, a collection of individuals with talent and training is required to achieve mining excellence. And our guest today is one of them. My name is Philip Nyakbo, and this is African Pod Business Forum, the audio and video podcast for thoughtful business conversations worldwide. Bosco Tete is one of the special individuals in the mining industry with the necessary talent, training, and passion. He works as the global senior consultant at Hexagon Mining. From his base in Perth, Australia, he is regularly called on at a moment's notice to go to any location in the world where his expertise is required at a busy mine site. Bosco has 20 years experience in the mining industry and his technical knowledge is remarkable. As he takes his turn on African Port Business Forum, Bosco Tete reveals what is involved in advanced mining fleet management for global operational excellence. It's amazing that you've been in the mining industry for 20 years and yet you look like someone in your late teens. (laughs) <laughs> Thanks, Phil, for for having me. And I saw I know my face looks a bit like a teenager. Yeah, I've been in the industry for 20 years. It has never been my dream. I've never thought about becoming a mining engineer. But my dream was to become a medical doctor. And I missed that at A level. And the next option is to become a chemical engineer. And my dad said, no, you have to do mining. What's the role you're playing at the moment in the mining industry? Um, being a mining engineer and having used most of traditional mining packages, mind you, all mining engineers want to become mine managers and managing directors in the future by trying to learn the mining planning softwares, be it data mine, Vulcan, SEPAC, and so forth. I started as a production money engineer at the time back after school. And then uh, along the way, Gofos in Ghana decided to adopt the fleet management system, which is the automatic way of assigning machines to optimize production. So the mine manager at the time decided to pick up money engineers and then we put our hands up. I was one of the six people who were given the chance to try that out. And that's how come I've started working as a money money engineer, but specialized in fleet management system. And because it's a unique area in mining operation, because it's all guided by optimizing the fleet and getting the most efficient use of them, in order to save costs. So it has been an opportunity for me to try to do that and Along the way, I have to learn on my own to try to get to where I am today. Even though I must commend people who helped me along the way to training, mentoring, and training on the job especially. And of course, at the moment, you are the global senior consultant at Hexagon Mining. It, it sounds like a, a fairly heavy responsibility. Yes, it is, Phil. Uh, having worked for Hexagon initially as a senior consultants just to try to make sure we help our customers to get the most out of the software that they bought. Uh, Along the way, I started traveling to other countries to try to help them because of the need for other regions of Hezagon mining who do not have the required skill set of people to be able to help their customers. So I started traveling around to Indonesia, to Africa, so just last year, early 2019, it's actually started when I joined the company back in 2015. Then in 2018, there was discussion that they should help me or they should allow me to help other customers globally. So at one of the conferences of the managers back in the U.S., so they decided to appoint me as a, a global senior consultant. A customer who are not getting the most out of the system, 
it's my responsibility to work with feedback from the customers and trying to work as a intermediary between the customer and our product developer team to try to enhance our software to meet the customer expectation. As a global senior consultant, when you get that call or email to say, your ticket is ready, go to this country, exactly what does it mean? <laughs> that does mean another journey back into the wilderness. So basically, I know what the work entails at this stage, having worked in the same capacity for the past five years. So if the ticket comes, I'm always on, on the lookout that the next week I might not be in Australia. Which is to say you're always on call. I'm always on call. To go to any country basically. at any time. Yes. So even if I'm at work, I'm at home, I can go to work today and they said, look, there's a request from this customer that they need an expert to be on site to guide them on what they are doing. So immediately ticket is organized, I'll be in the plane. So we have one of the biggest customers of Hezago Mining based in Indonesia. Uh, they are called Sis Adaro Mining Services. So they mine coal for the mother company. So they have bought the software since 20, 2009, and they have not been able to use the system to its full capacity. And they have been struggling ever since. So I got a call in the fourth quarter of 2019 that I need to head to site to try to understand what is the issue and eventually try to put the customer in the right direction to unnet the potentials of the system. So I keep changing that because other commitments were coming within Australia for me to fulfill. So finally, I was pushed again in January to head to site. So that's why I went to site for a week to try to understand their issues. Even though I've been on that site before, most of the job I do on site is all about trying to listen to the customer, what they want to achieve with the system, and my recommendation, and get their feedback as well, and trying to tailor that in with the current configuration that they have in the system. Basically, those that I can change myself on my own, I do it. Those that demand for a change in code or a change in programming, that has to escalate it to the product development team. So what sort of interaction do you tend to have with the uh, customers you meet on the ground? No, basically, if I get to site, I try to talk to the subject master expert on site, which anybody can call the champion of the system on site. That person is supposed to be an evangelist of the system on site. So I have to first sit with the person and have a discussion on what are their expectations or what do they require from hexagon mining. And then with that information, I then have to talk to other stakeholders because our software is basically it's a collaboration, a coordination, it's a teamwork. So we expect the operators' compliance in using the system. We expect the supervisors to communicate with the people using the system. We expect the mining planning team to be able to design the plan such that it can merge or the, the planning package and then the, our software can marry together to uh, deliver the expected results. And I talk to management as well because we need their enforcement of the system on site so operators are able to do the right thing. So I talk to all sort of people even up to the general manager, to be able to get their consent on the changes we want to make. Those that involve petty change of configuration is done, free of charge. Those that need demand a code change, so we need to seek their management permission to be able to do that. So tell me, what exactly is this software um, that is deployed on my side, and exactly what does it do? So the software itself is called a fleet management system. That is the general mining industry name for it. And others will call it a dispatch system. But this is specifically related to mining. What it does is that the software is programmed using the mining operation as a guide. So in mining operation, the supervisors or the operation team, their job is to make sure they allocate trucks 
to the loading machines, which we call the excavators or shovels. And they are supposed to do that in such a way that there won't be a waste of time of both equipment. So in effect, we are saying that we want when a dump truck is assigned to an excavator or a loading unit, it goes there and load without wasting time. And then we don't want the loading unit to also wait for a hauling machine or a dump truck to come or before it gets loaded. So what basically the software tries to do is to use the computer programming, which we call a linear programming algorithm, to be able to match the dump trucks to the excavated in such a way that in the real world, we are saying there should be zero seconds waiting time between each of the machines. Zero seconds waiting time? Waiting time. Theoretically, that is how the software is trying to do. But in the real world, because the software is trying to imagine that the distance from the loading unit to the dumping location, looking at all the activities within the mining operation, the loading time, the hauling time, the spotting time, the traveling time, the backing time, the dumping time, put that all into consideration. The linear programming tries to add all those information together, then allocate a total number of tracks that can meet the digging rates of the excavator. So in the plain terms, if I say, a dump truck can load in two minutes. So two minutes in an hour, that means that we need that dump truck should be able to load 30 trucks. So what the linear program is trying to do is to be able to allocate trucks one after the other to that dump truck so that he'll be able to get that 30 load in one hour. So that is what he's trying to do. But in the real world, it doesn't happen like that because we assume the machines are running on the same speed throughout. If it is two minutes, it's two minutes. But in sometimes the loading unit might load more than two minutes. Sometimes it might load less than less than two minutes. So taking that into consideration, we're trying to get the KPI, which is called key performance indicators from the mind management or from the customer, to say, okay, we can allow that our trucks are allowed to wait for one minute. The lonely units can also wait for one minute. That is our measurement. So in that case, this will take care of, because if the truck is traveling, we do the computation in the algorithm in such a way that these trucks must travel in this route for 50 kilometers an hour. And then it goes to the dump and come back. In the real world, the truck doesn't travel 50 kilometers continuously it moves from inertia and increasing speed one after the other before it gets to 50. At that time, that 50 minutes is equivalent to a distant travel on the ground, which is then equated to the time for him to travel both ways. When it gets to a stop sign, the truck will have to stop and then move on. So those things are accounted for in the linear programming to allow the correct allocation of dump trucks to the excavators in such a way that we can get the maximum production out of the uh, excavators. It's a bit complicated in this way, but if you look at the software, if I try to break it down more, because what we do is that it's not just the software alone that is working. We do have hardware in the machine and hardware outside the machine, but the software cannot know where the machine is. So the next step is that we installed GPS receivers on the dump trucks, and then GPS receivers on the excavators, so that the software is able to know the position of the dump truck at any point in time. Then it will be editing or estimating the time that it will use to reach the excavator. So if you realize that this particular dump truck cannot get to this excavator at this time, in the linear programming, they allocate a different track that can meet that travel time so that the excavator will not wait for the truck to come. This is all very technical. It is very technical. Um, 
And because it's a computer group program, it's just like the way we look at it in the current age, I can relate that to the our normal environment these days where we have Google Home in the house. So you tell Google Home, I want to do this. And then it goes back into the system to try to understand what you are saying because you have trained your and voice make references. and make references. So it picks information from you because the Google Home understands your voice already and knows what you've been telling him for repeatedly. So he uses that to predict or understand exactly what you are trying to achieve and then give you the information. So in our area or in our industry, what the linear programming does is that it collects the information of the tracks as they are moving around and then use that to predict the next event when it's going to happen. So let's take, for example, I know a track has traveled from this area to this area. Another track is different, so it's also travel using a different time. Another track using different time. So in our system, the system uses what we call the four tracks or four cycle moving average. So by four tracks, the system collects all the mining cycle activities of a track and then use that average to predict the next occurrence of an event. Break it down again, I look at when a track travels from point A to point B, it takes him two minutes. Another track travels from across the same point, it takes him two and a half minutes. Another track, three minutes. Another track, one and a half minutes. So the system will average that value and then take it that, okay, if I want to send another track again using the same routes, then I am estimating this is how long it's going to take him. And that is the value the linear programming will use to estimate the next activity. So basically, that's why it does. So it will take all those cycle activities in mining. Anybody who knows mining in detail will know that a dump truck basically will have to load. They need to reverse to the excavator. They need to travel loaded. They need to travel empty. They need to reverse at the dump. They need to tip the material. So each of those activities are individually calculated. averaged and calculated for the linear programming to be able to predict the next events. You know, there's the saying that time is money yeah. and giving all these technical details you're describing, it seems like that is that is especially true in the mining industry. Would that be right? Yeah, you are right, Phil. Because we are time constrained in mining, every mining budget and every mining plan is based on tonnage per hour and that is related to cost. Let's take for example, one excavator sitting on the bench going to load. That machine is burning fuel. There's mechanical wear and tear on the machine. There's an operator sitting on it that you need to pay salary to. There's a supervisor running on the ground that you have to pay. So if that machine, we plan for him to make 20 loads an hour for us to meet our production target. So if that machine is not making 20 loads an hour, let's say for example, it's making 15. That means we are losing 15 loads of oh, production. Yeah. So if I take that 15 load, assuming 15 load that is the one that we made, five load we lost because of wastage of time during the production time. So if I take that five load as being a lost production, so that means five trucks loaded has not been done. So if I take one truck alone, assuming that that truck weighs 100 tons when it dumps the material, that 100 times times 5 is 500. So if 100 times times 5 is 500, that means I'm losing 500 tons of material that has, cannot be accounted for in production. Now take that into monetary terms. If we are mining and our stripping ratio, stripping ratio basically in mining is about how many material we move to be able to get the real gold or the real ore. So as a waste over the all. So if the five trucks of material, our stripping ratio says that for every five trucks that we mine, maybe one of them will be gold. So that means we need to take five, four trucks of waste, then we'll get one truck of all. And that one truck of all is what we will treat before we get the gold. Now, if we take that one into monetary terms, we are talking about, okay, one truck is 100 tons. That 100 tons is what we are going to treat at the process plant. 
So if you look at the process plant and we are saying that our recovery is, let's say, 90% or that 100 tons that we have, our gram per ton, which is the measure, the metric of gold, our gram per ton is, let's say, 2 gram per ton. So if we take that into consideration and go back into metallurgy aspect and try to understand the, the money aspect, you will say that, okay, 90% of that 100 tons that we mine, we can get gold out of it. So if we multiply that, this is just for one hour of one particular excavator. If we multiply to the next hour, to the next hour, to the end of the shift, so we are saying that, we have lost, let's say, an, a shift is 12 hours. But the machines need to park, they need to eat, they need to stop, and so forth. So let's take two hours out of that. So that means we have 10 hours to do productive work. So 10 hours, we are taking five trucks wasted every hour. And one of those trucks is all. So one or an hour times 10. So that means we are going into a 1,000. So that's a 1,000 tons that we wasted, which would have contained all. And that then goes to the process plant. If you do the metrics down, let's say we can get gold out of that. Or let's say we're getting a few kilograms out of that or a few ounces out of that. That is where we begin to see the implication of wasting of time in production cycle in relation to amount of money we can get. So if you look at the gold ounces that will come out of it and multiply by that by the price of gold today, which is 1500 then you see that for every... 12-hour shift that you run, this is how much money you have lost. And if you add that to day shift, night shift, that's 24 hours, then multiply by the week, multiply by the month, and a year, you can see the magnitude of the wastage that is in the system. So this system, which we call the dispatch system, trying to maximize the utilization of the fleet in such a way that we minimize losses. the wastage, the losses. And with everything you said, it just seems to me that you've got to be very mathematically inclined to be able to you know, speak about it the way you have. Having been in this industry for, the, for 20 years, uh, which 16 of those years have been with fleet management system, only five years I have actually used as a production engineer doing planning and so forth. So at those over 16 years that I have with a dispatch system has given me enough exposure with three different type of fleet management system in the world. As I was researching in order to interview you, I knew talking to you in some ways will feel like drinking from a fire hose <laughs> in terms of you know how much technical uh, knowledge you have based on your experience of 20 years. But also mining is uh, understood to be highly uh, dependent on precision and on accuracy and also safety. How true is it? It's, it's very true. Um, we believe that nobody should go to work and not come back to his or her family. Every mine has a duty of care to their employees. So in that case, we in Hezago Mining have an end-to-end -end software in mining operation. So we do have the software that will optimize the operation so that a company can get benefits for their shareholders. So we do have a software which we call Mine Protect that does collision avoidance, fatigue. So basically what we do there is, again, it's a software and hardware combination to try to determine the proximity of the next available equipment to each other. Mind you, these mining equipment are very huge. They are giants. And somebody sitting in that small tiny cabin will not be able to see people that are working on the ground or even a live vehicle. So dump truck can walk over a live vehicle easily without feeling it or to put it in the plain terms, it's like you driving your small sedan car and pass through a small piece of rock. You just drive and go. You don't tend to see what has happened. That's how it is in mining. Like maybe driving over a coin. A coin. So we have the hardware, precision hardware on all machines in the mine. So most mines that have it will see that 
the moment another equipment is getting closer to another equipment, a trying to beep and give warning from slow. So we have the proximity range that we configure on each of the machine, depending on the machine size. So if the equipment is smaller, that means the proximity, we need to increase it. But we take the recommendation from the mine and build that into the software. So that when you are getting closer to the next equipment, you have a visual on, on the curve to show you that you are getting closer to this equipment and this is how close you are to that equipment. And the sound, the intensity of the sound will go from the lowest to the highest to trying to disturb and catch your attention for you to stop. The next stage of that, which we call the vehicle intervention. So the vehicle intervention is basically what we see in our most of our cars today that we drive. If you are not able to, to stop within the reasonable time frame, the software will take control of a machine and stop. And we do have the one for the fatigue as well. The night is meant to sleep. It's not meant to work. So when people are working in night shift, we do understand that people can fall asleep. So we do have a software that can read people's micro sleep on their faces and can also read distraction. So trying to distinguish between a driver who is distracted from a driver who is actually falling asleep. So trying to read or your micro sleep. Experience in a micro sleep. Yes, micro sleep. And trying to build that into the logic to assume or not to assume to determine that this driver needs help. So you need to pack the equipment. And that sends information to the supervision on site and then to the control room operator to be able to intervene and pack that machine. One machine having an accident in the mine is a big dollar for the companies. So putting a few dollars on the machine, if you're trying to prevent that, it's a huge benefit for the mine. And it makes me also uh, imagine that uh, in a verifiable way, of course, that you would come under multiple regulatory umbrella in this high-risk work within the mining industry? Yeah, for us, in Hezago Mining, uh, our management have taken it upon themselves to try to talk to most of the countries where we operate, to try to understand what are the legal requirements of trying to meet the safety standard of the, of the, of the country. Because the moment there's a fatality in the mine, now it's government related. All the nitty gritty will have to go into it. They have to dispatch both to side to understand the causes and measures not to have that repeat itself again. So an example is a mine in South Africa that we have deployed our safety products some years back. And that safety product actually won us a world award of safety in mining. So South Africa government came up with a rule that no mine should operate without a safety software to save life. And I'm aware that you've traveled to and traveled travel to so many different countries. You worked in many countries as well. And in all these travels, I still consider myself as having not had so much of the industry yet. And being a mining engineer with the first step out of my country to Zambia, to Tanzania, Namibia, South Africa, and having been working with Hezagona, which has taken me to a lot of countries, New Caledonia, Indonesia, I've gone several times, Kazakhstan, several times, and within Australia, I've been to a fair bit of mine over here. The main thing is that I tried to adopt or go with the culture of the people that I meet every day, because the best way you can interact with people is trying to understand their culture. So the first thing I do when I go to any country is trying to understand the culture of that country, how I can relate to people, things that I need to say, things that I don't need to say, especially coming from Ghana, which is a liberal country. So some of the things I can do in Australia free or go to Ghana and behave without any caution, Indonesia, you have to be careful. So you have to make sure you adopt or you go with what is required to respect the culture. To respect the culture of the people. 
what would you say about just how important the mining industry is uh, in terms of the modern life that is lived today? Apart from the fact that we're trying to dig out minerals from the bottom of the ground to satisfy human life, people who want gold, yeah, demands, yep. People who want gold, people who want diamond, and even coal for energy. Apart from that, there's still a significant side of the mining that people do not know, which is the returns on investment to improve the lots of the communities in which the mining companies operate. So there are royalties that are paid by the mining companies. There are taxes that are paid to the government and their employable skills that the mining companies give to the local people. So given your background, given your background, everything you've done and continue to do after two decades in the industry, how do you see the future? The future is very bright, even though the minerals are getting finished at the bottom of the earth. The and coal in, doesn't seem to be something that is uh, desirable uh, for digging out. Yep, it's not desirable to be dug. Again, if you look at the countries that are mining coal, and see, you know of the countries that are benefiting from coal, if there will be interventions from government to try to supplement or replace the current energy sources of those people, it will be good. Australia is still the leader in mining operation technology. So there's a lot to learn from this country. Bosco, it's a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Thank you, Phil, Thank you for, for having me. me. Thank you so much. That was the thoughtful business conversation with Bosco Tete, Global Senior Consultant at Hexagon Mining. Bosco has 20 years experience in the mining industry with a remarkable technical knowledge for operational excellence. African Port Business Forum is produced by African Port Media in Perth, Australia, Silicon Valley of Mining, Energy and Business. Subscribe free to our audio podcast. We are on Apple Podcast, Spotify, Google Podcast or wherever you listen to your podcast. To find us on YouTube, just search for African Port Business Forum. Our website, africanport.com, has more information. And follow us on social media by searching for African Port. And don't forget to check all of our previous interviews with exceptional guests, all on African Port Business Forum. <laughs>